Hello and welcome everyone. On behalf of Rice 360 Institute for Global Health Technologies, uh, the Rice Program in Medical Humanities and the Rice Poverty, Justice and Human Capabilities Program, it is my sincere pleasure to welcome you all here today um, for this panel event on African American Maternal Health Outcomes, Transcending the Legacy of Racism and Bias Impacting Healthcare Quality and Medical Technology Design. Um, at this intersection between Black History Month and Women's History Month, we've invited this distinguished panel of guests to foster a discussion on how bias and racism impacts maternal health care, the current status of African American maternal health in Texas and the US, and how healthcare providers and innovators, both current and those uh, who aspire to those careers, uh, can advance meaningful change. Joining us today are Dr. Carrie Epps, a maternal fetal medicine physician at the Baylor College of Medicine and chief of obstetrics uh, for Ben Taub Hospital in Houston. Um, her primary areas of focus are quality and safety and infectious diseases in pregnancy. Uh, in addition, she has served as a leader within public health organizations that advocate for quality maternal health care for all women. Dr. Ann Gill um, is also a professor at the Baylor College of Medicine, uh, but she's in the Department of Pediatrics and in the Center for Medical Ethics and Health Policy, um, as well as an assistant dean in the Office of Curriculum. In, 27, uh, sorry, in 2007, with a grant from the NIH, Dr. Gill developed an unconscious bias workshop for medical students that is now part of the Baylor College of Medicine uh, curriculum. And last year, she published uh, on, the, on the longitudinal outcomes of implicit bias training for uh, medical. And online, we have joining us uh, Dr. April Lovelady, who is the Director of Innovation Immersion Experiences and, instructional associate, and, and an instructional associate professor at the Texas A&M University School of Engineering Medicine. Her research interests include medical devices and instrumentation and wearable devices for infectious prevention, infection prevention and control. And as an engineer and entrepreneur, Dr. Lovelady has taken numerous medical technologies from the bench to the market. Um, following the panelists' talks, uh, we will have a moderated Q&A. Uh, serving as our moderator today is uh, Shivani Golapalli. Um, Shivani is a junior at Rice, studying cell and molecular biology and sociology. She is also a student in the Global Health Technologies minor. Um, she is interested in addressing social inequalities and injustices that affect health outcomes and does work with various community organizations with the within the intersection of health, equity, racial justice, and gender equality. So uh, without further ado, uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Epps. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for having us here. Um, as she mentioned, I'm a maternal fetal medicine physician. So what that means is my entire job is taking care of um, pregnant women who have high-risk conditions over the course of their pregnancy. Um, and I have had the experience of training in a lot of different areas of the country and then coming to Texas when I actually started being a faculty. Um, and a lot of what I wanted to talk about today is kind of what the face of maternal health looks like in Texas. Um, and while um, it's really heartbreaking to hear a lot about the maternal mortality crisis worldwide, um, really and truly a core part of the maternal crisis in our state is just related to the impact of racism and the huge healthcare disparities for black women in our state. Um, she mentioned I do some public health roles in the state, so many of the things that I am presenting to you I chair, um, but I am sharing with you as <laughs> Carrie Epps, myself as a maternal fetal medicine physician, not in any of those roles, um, which just means I can speak a little bit more freely about some of it. Um, I also acutely realize you know, this is the space I live and work in all the time, and so we are constantly talking about the problems with maternal mortality. Um, but that might not be what you guys are used to seeing. So I'm going to try to kind of take a step back and explain some things, but also show you what it looks like in our, in our state and why this is such an important priority. So in our state public health-wise, there are a couple of big groups that work towards the care for mothers and infants. The first is our Maternal Morbidity and Mortality Review Committee, which in our state is where all of the data about why pregnant women are having severe outcomes or dying come from. I don't know if you all heard, there was a lot of drama in the news um, when we delayed that report, and a lot of it is because of information I'm going to share with you guys here since it's been released. So that report that was delayed in September got released in December, 
and many of that information is what's um, here, which is just a really sad state to be showing because it hasn't changed that much from the report in 2020 or the report two years before that or the report two years before that. The other thing is something called Texas AIM, which is the Alliance on Innovation and Maternal Care, which is actually a national and now international group that works on standardizing safety protocols for pregnant women, so how you know, hospitals know how to respond to hemorrhage or severe hypertension that could be preeclampsia or things like that. Um, is something we have been working on in Texas, but I think um, the lessons that we have learned in the approach and the key difference when you don't add elements of health equity into a safety bundle is what I wanted to share with you guys here today. And then finally, our State Perinatal Quality Collaborative, which is the group that's funded to work on quality improvement projects. And some of the things we learned about, um, you know, this is the maternal health space is really much, much larger than um, OBGYNs or labor and delivery or things like that. It's actually emergency departments and community areas and churches. And the way to truly impact care is so much larger than I think many people um, necessarily realize. So I was going to talk a little bit about that. So... Um, in this report from December of 2022, um, there are a couple of key findings regarding um, our mothers in Texas and the huge healthcare disparities that we see. And this is from reviewing all of the cases of maternal death in our state. And um, our committee spends a really long time reviewing each case and all of the records that go along with it and making recommendations that we hope might change um, for the next pregnant woman. Um, and so much of this is really rooted in the impact of things like racism and social determinants of health in our state and um, how it contributed to these women's death. So we found that at least 12% of the maternal deaths, discrimination was a direct reason um, why that happened and could have prevented that outcome, meaning a maternal death. That many of these deaths had a complex interaction. So that includes things like the social environment, the community environment, the hospital, the provider, the patient circumstances, and most cases don't involve just one, but I think learning the um, societal community impact on many of these has been very eye-opening and something our committee is doing a lot more with. Um, the huge persistent disparities in health outcomes for our non-Hispanic black and Hispanic white moms in our state, and very sadly, it has only increased, especially from 2020 onwards. Um, we also have a state that has huge geographic disparities because it looks really different in areas of our state. So there are areas where a hospital will be open to deliver babies from 8 to 5 and then not from 5 to 8 a.m. because they don't have providers that can do that. And as you can imagine, that doesn't make any sense, right? Labor does not wait just for business bank hours. Um, in fact, most babies are born in the middle of the night, but it's because they don't have, they're in what we call a critical access area, and that's a huge portion of, of our state and why we have such geographic disparities. Um, and then as we are starting, this, this review is from the cases of 2019, so there's still a significant amount of data lag, which is a whole separate um, discussion, but um, really starting in April 2020, we saw the huge healthcare disparities related to COVID-19 and their disproportionate impact on um, some of our populations especially for Hispanic women. So because of that, that committee had several recommendations. Um, this is really important for all of us because um, this is sort of the charge that the rest of our organizations, like the ones I talked about earlier, are supposed to take up to try to improve health outcomes. Why is this so important? Um, you know, maternal health isn't just about the 1% of the population that is pregnant at any given time. It's the way our entire population occurs, and it sets the health of the entire population. It's also really looked at as a um, marker of women's value in a society, what happens with the maternal mortality rate. So it's, there's so much more than just what's happening to pregnant women embedded in these. Um, but big things are increased access to comprehensive health services throughout pregnancy and thereafter. It's a big reason why we keep trying to um, request from our legislature to expand Medicaid coverage to at least a year because so many of the maternal deaths happen from delivery to 365. In fact, I would say the vast majority of things related to preeclampsia are in that time period, and our committee has found all of them to be preventable. Um, engaging black communities and those that support them in the development of maternal and women's health programs, it's clearly not working, so we need to do it in a different way that is more meaningful um, to the women who are disproportionately impacted. Implementing maternal state um, health and safety initiatives, like the AIM bundles that I'm going to talk about in a bit, but I think doing it in a really thoughtful way 
And I'm going to, um, as somebody who led those initiatives, really tell you the problem with the first round that we did and why they didn't make a bigger impact, and then increase public awareness and community engagement to create a foster, a community of maternal health, safety, and disease prevention. The only thing I want to highlight is, I don't think I realized until I did this, how much of care pregnant postpartum women get is outside of those environments. So when we pulled the state, almost all pregnant women from the time they'd leave a hospital, um, they're going back into emergency departments. And of course, the emergency departments don't have the same idea that the rest of us do, that that, that is a critical time when um, women who have recently had a baby are at an increased risk. And when the majority of maternal deaths are occurring, they also don't know the impact that we know on things like implicit bias on the way we're responding to women. And so when we don't, um, when we remain in kind of little, this is my maternal health silo, it doesn't improve care. Um, so really working on focusing on areas just outside of labor and delivery units. So how do we look and see if discrimination played a role? Because that's something a lot of people ask. When I say 12% of our maternal deaths, discrimination was a direct role. There's actually, um, our state is one of the states that piloted the way to look at that. Um, and we, each case, we ask our committee, you know, did discrimination contribute to death? And then there are all sorts of criteria that we use, including discrimination, interpersonal racism, structural racism, areas where bias existed. Um, and there's so much that you can learn to look in the medical record about the way people might polarize the response of every future physician that looks in the medical record to that pregnant woman. So if I say, you know, she, in quote, um, missed her prenatal care visit, but I put missed in quotes, it implies, you know, she she had some role in missing it, not that she just missed it, things like that. And we, unfortunately, do that a lot pervasively um, in healthcare and know that it does play a big impact on how patients do. So um, in our uh, quality and safety role in healthcare, we use a lot of these charts, and I just want to kind of show you why this is such a big problem in Texas. So this is a graph doing something that we call disaggregating or breaking down the impact on severe maternal morbidity, which is a defined diagnosis. So if a woman comes in and has a delivery and then has a set of events, like gets admitted to an ICU and needs mechanical ventilation, ends up with um, a breathing tube or a tracheostomy, ends up with a heart attack, those are the things that play into severe maternal morbidity during delivery. We have a really high rate of it, unfortunately, in our state at baseline. But if you look, the red line is our non-Hispanic black women compared to everyone else. So you can see it's dramatically different and worse. And it is weighted for the percentage of the population they represent. So meaning this isn't just based on volume, but these numbers are really, if you look at cases compared to the percentage of the population, they are disproportionately impacted by severe maternal morbidity. And every graph I'm going to show you, hemorrhage, hypertension, sepsis, looks this way. Um, and there are a lot of key reasons why we think that might be. So looking at Texas for that severe maternal morbidity, which again is a really significant thing, right? That means you come in for a hospitalization. You're in general a young reproductive age person who can have children. Many of them are healthy. And then you leave with this major complication, like renal failure needing dialysis. You have a stroke. You need mechanical ventilation. So not what most people expect is going to happen to this young, healthy population. Sadly, we know that our black women in Texas are twice as likely to experience critical health issues surrounding delivery, and that doesn't even include what happens afterwards, so substantially more likely in hemorrhage, preeclampsia, and sepsis. And this number is going to just continue to look very different over the course of the impact after the COVID pandemic. Okay, so what did we do? Um, we started with identifying what we thought might be the most um, likely area that we could intervene, and that was in something like hemorrhage, um, which are largely in the hospital. And so we did these safety bundles where really we focused on standardizing the response to hemorrhage. But we did nothing to address the health inequities and the impact of things like racism, bias, and social determinants of health. It was just these are the standard ways that we should be treating all pregnant women in Texas. Um, and we did that with all 224 hospitals that deliver babies in the state. So we had a lot of improvements, right? So hospitals suddenly started doing things that they hadn't been before. They were measuring blood loss and responding differently and assessing risk. Um, and we thought, all right, great, we've done this like really fantastic job. Kudos to us. We had an overall decrease in severe maternal morbidity for these different areas in Texas, um, which again, we thought we had done this fantastic job. And we saw it geographically throughout, so thought, all right, we're doing great. A couple of things. Um, in the context of that time, our rates of morbidity related to hemorrhage actually decreased. And this is um, 
around where the pandemic started and around when we were doing those bundles. But in the backdrop of overall severe maternal morbidity in our state increasing. So why is that? When we knew hemorrhage was such a big part of it, but we were making improvements in hemorrhage, why did the overall rates worsen for everyone else? It's because it continued to worsen for our black maternal patients. We improved it for everybody else, but not them, because there was no, no targeted intervention for equity and the impact of those things. And so this is a huge story in you cannot have quality without equity. You cannot um, improve stuff for other people without improving it to the populations that are disproportionately impacted. Um, and so while we thought we did this great thing, we actually really made it worse for the people who were already disproportionately impacted. This is what it looks like for preeclampsia, and we're starting to do the same thing. We already know that, unfortunately, our non-Hispanic black moms have substantially more morbidity related to things like preeclampsia, which is where you have markedly elevated blood pressure in the context of delivery um, that usually improves at some point within 42 days after delivery, but often not before then. In fact, often gets worse before then. And so this time around, our state will be trying to really focus on making care more equitable. That is a big task. There's a lot to do. So it's not just like do it in this way, but really like each hospital team needs to look at the impact of their own bias. They all need to go through implicit bias. They all need to start doing case reviews to looking at where um, inequitable care caused the outcome in their patients. But that's what many of our hospitals in our state are now doing. And assessing for social determinants of health, which we know are dramatically related to patients' outcomes. So for example, um, when we look at things like why our black maternal patients come into care later than our um, non-Hispanic white Caucasian patients, it's often related to things like having insurance, having transportation, having an inviting healthcare community that they haven't had a bad outcome with already before. All of those things that we need to bridge to try to improve outcomes. Um, so this bundle has a whole different aspect of respectful and equitable care. Um, where we are really specifically trying to do that and engage patients and communities in the way we are trying to improve things going forward. Um, so it is very different, and it's a much larger, more complex thing that we need to take on. But again, in our state, it's not going to get better if we improve for some, but not the people that it needs to. Um, so I just wanted to kind of start with framing that. Um, it's so sad to be up here and talking about, like, globally the impact of maternal mortality, but really we know probably one of the biggest causes of maternal morbidity and mortality in our state is, is related to implicit bias and racism and things like that. So a lot of work to do ahead, but I hope your generation will really help with that. So thank you for that lovely introduction. I am so honored to be here today. Um, when I was asked if I would be willing to come and present, I was like, uh, are you sure you got the right person? Why me? You know, and um, I'm not a physician. My doctorate's in public health. Uh, but I do a lot of work in curriculum, and we have a program that we developed, and it might be of some interest to you. All right, so my teaching objectives for today are to identify the rationale for adding implicit bias into the School of Medicine curriculum, to explain some of the challenges that we face, some of the facilitating factors, and other reasons for including uh, implicit bias into the medical school curriculum. And lastly, to describe our experience from the last 14 years of holding a workshop and training our students. So in terms of background, how did this happen? Uh, back in 2007, Baylor College of Medicine received a million dollar grant from the NIH, and this was uh, specifically designated to increase the uh, behavioral sciences into the medical school curriculum. And the focus of our specific grant was that uh, we were wanting to be delivering relationship-centered care. So obviously, it's pretty hard to be relationship-centered if you are harboring uh, implicit or explicit biases. Around this very same time, there was this landmark article that was published by Dr. Alex Green and it provided the very first evidence of race implicit bias among physicians. I mean, everybody knew this was a thing, you know, but now we had, you know, some rigorous documentation of it. The results suggested that unconscious biases may contribute to racial ethnic disparities in the use of medical procedures, and in this particular case, it was thrombolysis for myocardial infarction. 
So prior to this, over at Baylor, when we were working with our students and trying to talk about issues related to implicit biases, we used uh, some videos that were called Worlds Apart. They were very well done. Uh, we also had some cases that we used to try to help the students um, you know, get the mindset of what could or could not happen. This approach was really, really hard on our faculty. You know, most of our faculty did not want to get up and assume a racist persona uh, and or take on a contrary position. You know, they found it emotionally uh, exhausting uh, and mentally challenging. So what we did is we thought, okay, well, we'll take this information that we got from the uh, article and we built a workshop. And the workshop was centered around using the implicit associations test. For those of you that might not be familiar with it, what the IAT proposes to do is to measure implicit bias by calculating how long it takes to match a picture or words to a corresponding construct or characteristic. The IAT operationalizes implicit bias by proposing that it takes less time to match a group word or image to a characteristic that you already associate with that group. Conversely, characteristics that are not associated with the group require more time to match. So basically a bias with that association. So here are the objectives that we had for the workshop uh, from the very beginning and they continue to stay the same. After the session, we want our medical students to acknowledge that bias is inherent in physicians' perspectives. That we ask them to verbalize the impact of stereotyping and personal bias in medical decision making. To recognize that self-reflection is one method for understanding one's own racial biases. And to list strategies to manage physician biases in patient care. So um, the workshop, um, to explain a little bit about it and, and how it uh, transpired, before the students were to go to the workshop, we gave them uh, two articles to read. We asked them to read um, Alex Green's article. Uh, that has stayed consistent. And every year, we usually would pick out something a little bit more current and related and have them read that as well. We uh, told them that they needed to complete two IATs. We wanted them to do the one on race, and we wanted them to do the one on weight. Now, we didn't want to embarrass anybody, and our job wasn't to see, oh my gosh, you're so racist, this is terrible. What we did is we said, you, you need to turn them in anonymously, and you get checked off. So that way we knew that when the students came to the workshop, they were ready for learning, as we say. So on the day of the workshop, the students would gather in the auditorium, and they would complete a survey about their experience taking the IAT and asking them you know, some questions. After that, the students would then get into small groups. Uh, and one of the important uh, factors of our workshop, one of the things that really made it successful, is that we were very careful about picking facilitators. We did cherry pick. We looked for the best. And they, you know, Luckily for us, they agreed to, to help us with these uh, sessions. And they um, wanted them to discuss a series of questions that were related to implicit bias, just plain vanilla, the relationship of um, implicit bias to clinical practice, and also strategies to combat the impact of implicit biases. Uh, after that, time of discussion in the small group, the students then went on to complete a survey at the end of the small group session. So what happened? What were our results? So since 2008, we have convened this workshop for all of our third year medical students. We update the material every single year as new information becomes available. But the basic outline and the teaching strategies for this workshop have not changed. The results presented here, uh, these are uh, aggregated for you so you can see you know, the types of questions that we were asking. Uh, they were all statistically significant. They have remained statistically significant every year since. 
Uh, and we published this data in MedEd Portal in 2010. So how many of you are familiar with MedEd Portal? Ever hear about it? Okay. It, it's unusual. It is a repository of medical and dental school curriculum. The idea being that why are we reinventing the wheel every single year, developing new curriculum when there are people out there who have these programs at work? And so when it gets published in MedEd Portal, then it becomes free. It's available to everyone across the country. So the reason I actually am telling you that is to understand that uh, there are people all across the U.S. that have adopted uh, this curriculum. Uh, they may make changes to it and make it more, you know, useful in their particular setting, but we continue to get feedback from folks who have used it and have found it to be um, efficacious. So about five years ago, um, we wanted to know if this workshop was still helping us meet our curricular objectives, and if so, did the outcomes from this workshop persist after a year? So what we did is we resurveyed our fourth year medical students. And this was almost one year to the day. They, they had it in the spring of their third year, and then you know, right that same week in their fourth year, they took it again. We collected data from two cohorts of senior students, and we found all but one question was statistically significant from pre-workshop, post-workshop, to one year after. There was one question that was not statistically significant, and it was one that we probably should have disregarded because in the context of a year out, it really didn't make sense. Another thing that we found interesting with this study is that we had a cohort of about 17 students who were off cycle. Uh, and what that means is that in their journey, in their four years of medical school, they took off time to do things like go get an MPH, or they wanted to get an MD-PhD, or they might come to Rice to get their MD-MBA. Uh, but whatever the reason, they were anywhere from one to five years off cycle. And we found that for those 17 students, their results were still statistically significant as, you know, holding and standing. And so, uh, again, that suggests it might last for even longer than one year. So we published these results in a medical teacher last year. If you, you know, are uh, trying to go to sleep and you need something to help you there, you can uh, pull this up. Uh, but uh, it, that was very gratifying. I told a colleague of mine that nothing makes this educator's heart smile more than when students remember what we taught them. It's just, oh, wow, <laughs> the great high. Well, what's changed over time? What are some of the things that we learned? Well, in the very early years, um, we, uh, you know, had a lot of students who had never even heard of the IAT. Uh, when we would meet in the auditorium and I'd ask them how many have heard of it or taken one before, it was only about four or five students. And uh, I don't mind telling this crowd, they were almost all RISE graduates. Um, then as time went on, we'd see more and more and more, and now today, about 80% have heard of it, they've taken it. It's, it's kind of like, oh yeah, I've been there, done that. Also in the early years of the workshop, the atmosphere around the small group was way more emotionally charged. Uh, the teaching supplies always included a box of Kleenex. Uh, there were tears. And after the debriefing, the facilitators would comment on how challenging it was to lead this uh, workshop because of the emotional energy. It's interesting, around 2015, we began to see a change. I have no reason or explanation for it, uh, but it became much more nonchalant, uh, not because the students didn't care, because actually the students were more comfortable uh, in discussing the topic. Another thing that has changed, and this is a, a you know, very positive thing, is we have uh, much, many more strategies for managing implicit bias. In the very beginning, there were only three that were evidence-based, uh, awareness or mindfulness, perspective taking, and then uh, either exposure or immersion experience. And thanks to the amazing work that our colleagues at the Kerwin Institute have uh, engaged in, and there's a book called Blind Spot, uh, we have these additional strategies, uh, stereotype replacement, counter-stereotypic imaging, individuation, and partnership building.
I'm at an engineering retreat today for the School of Engineering and Medicine, so um, thank you for bearing with me. Um, so my name is April Lovelady, and I am the Director of Innovation Immersion Experiences at the School of Engineering and Medicine with Texas A&M. And what that means is that I work with students on real-world projects um, to help them actually innovate um, solutions to real-world clinical needs that they see while they're on their clinical rotations. I am also a um, medical device co-founder, so I've co-founded two medical device companies, um, one that's actually in the dialysis space, so um, a lot of the dialysis population are actually minorities, and another that's related to the prevention of surgical site infections. And um, I'm really passionate about translating academic technologies to the marketplace. I don't think it does us any good at all um, to spend our taxpayer dollars on uh, grants <laughs> and supporting grants if we're not actively making an effort to um, if we're not actively making an effort to get those discoveries to the public and in the hands of the public. I'm actually going to talk to you a little bit about innovating in the medical space. And so this will certainly translate over to uh, fetal maternal health. But in general, when we talk about innovation, we talk about design thinking. And you can see this slide here starts with, you know, empathizing. And so we see that someone has a need and we want to help them. Then we then have to further define the problem. So is this problem related to a particular age group, a particular population? And what are the constraints? We didn't take our time and we think about different ways that we might be able to solve this problem. And we choose the best solution to move forward with and we prototype that solution and then we test it. And so what you're looking at here looks like a linear process. And so oftentimes what happens when a process is linear is we sometimes um, get to the end and there are new things that we discover, but because it was linear, we never actually go back and incorporate that into the design process. So what design thinking actually looks like should be more of a figure eight here, right, of an infinity symbol where, you know, we've empathized and defined the need, we've come up with solutions, we've prototyped them and tested them. But then as we learn new lessons from testing those, we actually go back to the beginning and we incorporate those things that we learn. And so that's important because oftentimes when we go through the design thinking process, we don't think about minorities. We don't think about particular um, groups and categories. And so it's incumbent upon us once we realize that we have neglected a particular set of the population that we then go back and we incorporate the needs of that, of that population and of that subset into our solution. When we don't do that, we always, we talk about, it's really being sort of exclusive when we don't do that. We talk about diversity, we talk about equity, but if you don't have inclusion in that, then we're really being exclusive. And so I brought this, I wanted to show this slide because oftentimes in that design thinking process, minorities are not included. Women are not included. And so when we're not included in those early discussions, we're really being exclusive and we're excluding the diversity of thought that's required to um, innovate successfully. And so here's an example of that, right? This is um, a pulse oximeter. It's something that when you go to the doctor, we use all the time. It became really important um, when the pandemic set. And so the issue is that pulse oximeters don't really work well on dark skin uh, people, right? So it gives us erroneous readings because of the way that they work, right? It's the infrared technology doesn't interact well with the melanin in our skin. But there's been very little innovation, even though we know this, there's been very little innovation on a device that's used regularly um, throughout the, uh, the clinical process, but we're still here with these erroneous readings for minorities, right? Here's a second device, and this is one that I personally experienced. So again, this uses IR, and so that's really great because it maps out the veins underneath your skin. So you should be able, a phlebotomist, a phlebotomist should be able to see your vein and hit it on the first try. Well, I can tell you what happened with me personally is that when I was in a doctor's office, you know, they told me about this vein view, and I was like, oh, yeah, that's great. Now, I have great veins, okay? So no one ever misses my veins. You can see them. They don't roll, you know, one stick, and, and that's it. But when the phlebotomist tried to use this vein viewer on me, she missed my vein. And I thought that was really interesting because I'm sitting here. I'm looking at my veins. She's looking at my veins. But when she tried to cannulate, she missed. 
I thought that was so weird. So she tried three times and then she wanted to go in my hand. And by the time I was like, oh, you know what? That's it. That's it. The next day I went to um, um, a clinic to have my blood drawn. There was a seasoned phlebotomist there. And she sat down, she hit my vein first try. But the point being, when this device was tested, it was not tested utilizing people of color. And so now you have a device that's out there on the market, which they have since come back, um, right? And, and made... Uh, corrections to, but initially it was out there on the market, not having been tested on anyone um, with a significant amount of melanin in their skin. And so it was causing people to, to miss these cannulations so that they would have to be stuck multiple times. So this is what diversity with inclusion looks like. When we are uh, innovating and coming up with solutions to these clinical problems, you want to include everyone. And what I've recently learned about myself, right? I took a, I took a test that um, measured my cultural adaptiveness, right? And so this test was really interesting because it told you the way that you saw yourself versus the way that you actually are, right? And so what I learned about myself is I see myself actually as being culturally adaptive, but I'm really culturally accepting, which means that in the beginning, I want to know everyone's thoughts, but at the end, I don't go back to find out your thoughts later because I have to, you know, I've got a goal to meet. And so we want to create these diverse um, uh, experiences around the table at the beginning where people can be both um, culturally accepting and culturally adapted with, uh, with the device innovation space. I saw this online and I thought it was, it was really interesting. Um, there's a crisis within healthcare technology research and development, wherein historically marginalized groups are under-researched in preclinical studies, underrepresented in clinical trials, misunderstood by clinical practitioners, and harmed by biased medical technology. And again, this all goes back to when you're sitting around the table, you've, you've identified a problem and you're sitting around the table and you're talking about a solution, who is at the table? Because if women are not at the table, if minorities are not at the table, then those are valuable viewpoints that are not being included in the solution. And so then who are we designing a solution for, right? We're designing a solution in that case that fits like a certain population and it's not an inclusive solution. And so I wanted to put this quote up here because not only once you're not included at the beginning, then that sort of carries over into your preclinical studies and carries over into your, your clinical trials, right? And so that brings me to this, you know, <laughs> this image of pigs, right? You may wonder what do pigs have to do with anything? So I wanted to show this because again, in sort of my own um, personal experience, we were talking about um, conducting a clinical study um, looking at the prevention of surgical site infections and the skin of pigs is really similar to the skin of humans. And that's why they, they use the pig model for looking at things that impact the skin. And so I was the only minority female. There was one other woman on my team, but I was the only other minority female on the team. And I spoke up and I said, well, hey, the pigs that we're, we're looking at have white skin. I said, what about the pigs that have red skin or what about the pigs that have black skin, right? Because as we learned from the pulse oximeter, sometimes light interacts with melanin different from um, depending upon the content of the melanin in the skin, right? And I can tell you, I was outvoted <laughs> in that discussion, sadly, uh, because it seemed that we were, we were able to get our hands on white pigs maybe easier then we were able to get our hands on red pigs or on black pigs, right? So we we're getting ready to conduct a study that did not take into consideration the vast array of complexions that exist in our world. And so that brings me to this slide, which says that there's hidden bias everywhere. There's antiquated racial bias guidelines, um, for example, that used to be used with x-rays. And there was an adjustment that was made um, based on your race. And when this adjustment was made, it actually exposed Black people to higher levels of radiation than it did people of any other race. 
There are some devices that actually generate racially biased results. And we can sort of categorize these devices in three main categories. They're either computational, they can be physical, um, and there could be interpretation um, biases, which is like the race correction that was that used to be made for the X-rays machines. And all of that leads to a lack of diversity among algorithm designers. So as we have you know, our engineers and our designers working on these solutions, if that group, if that population in and of itself is not, is not diverse, then we have a lack of diversity amongst the algorithms and the devices that they are designing. And so that brings me to this story. Um, this is a young lady named April Valentine. Um, I actually saw this story pop up in my Instagram a couple of days ago. And she actually died giving birth um, at a hospital in Inglewood. You know, normal, healthy um, young lady who came into the hospital for what should have been a really exciting moment in her life, and it ended up with her losing her life. And this would be an example of like physical bias. Um, so you have someone come in, they're a person of color, those um, biases kick in, and then they may not receive the same treatment that others receive. And so the issue is that when we are dealing with patients and developing solutions to clinical needs, we know that researchers use race to build disease risk assessment tools, right? But how can we, how can we incorporate um, the needs of the population into our solutions without, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, without um, eliminating unconsciously the needs of those, of those particular populations? And so this is a shameless plug, shameless plug for my current employer, but I'm plugging it because I really, really believe in our mission. So the School of Engineering Medicine is designed to produce what we call physician ears. And this is a class of physicians. So these are medical doctors that have an engineering background so that when they identify a problem in the clinics, they are able to innovate solutions to those problems. And so this is really important because one of the things that we do that we believe in at InMed is you start um, with their medical education, talking about diversity of thought, talking about the the diversity of their populations that they're going to be working with so that we actually build that into the curriculum so that not only when they're physicians and they're practicing, um, they can identify this bias and hopefully eliminate it, but when they are innovators in developing solutions, they can identify the bias in that process, in that process and eliminate it there as well. And so this is what InMed looks like, right? This is sort of our inaugural class and um, this is what they look like. And so you see, you know, this is a diverse group. You see men and women represented. You see some minorities represented, but also what you don't see here in particular is African-Americans, right? Because I don't know why. Um, this would be a really good question. As African-Americans, we have all of these issues that we face, um, medical issues that we face as a population, but you look around and we're nowhere to be found um, in the clinical population. And so at InMed, that's one of the things that we're actually working on improving is trying to recruit and retain more African-American and more minority physicians and innovators. So with that said, um, this is our inaugural class. They'll be graduating in May 2023. And the hope is that we have educated a group of people who take into consideration the, the needs and the concerns of population of a population across the board, as opposed to maybe what's right in front of their faces that they may have overlooked. So with that, thank you everyone for your time and your attention. I really appreciate that. When advocating for maternal health, how do you drive meaningful change to achieve results? So what stakeholders are involved and what are some primary challenges that you run into? Um, so, well, in terms of the stakeholders, there's, there's an array, right? Obviously you have the mothers, um, but you also have the clinicians and you also have like the medical students and you have the innovators. You, it's really important to get that group of people together. One of the things that I say as engineers that we do a terrible job at is we actually go out and we design solutions for people that we think they want to have, right? 
and we try to force them on other people. Don't tell my other engineering colleagues I, I told you our secret, right? But we try to force our innovations on other people, as opposed to talking to the people, talking to the end users, talking to the clinicians, and finding out what are the true needs? Where can we make true change? And so I would actually bring that group of people together. And as the innovators, we've got to put our listening ears on, right? We've got to, got to take it back to, <laughs> to, to elementary school. We have to listen more. We've got to put our, our listening ears on and listen to what the actual problem is and then innovate, right, for that problem. So I would say the stakeholders, you have to talk to the mothers, you have to talk to the clinicians, and um, so that you can identify what the true issue is and then innovate for that true issue. I think it depends on what level you're trying to impact change. So it can be at the individual patient, um, physician, nurse, provider interaction level, and then I think engaging both of them. It can be at the state legislative policy level, the federal legislative policy level. So I think all of those are really important in having people work on all of those. But um, I think most importantly, taking the advice of the people who's, who you're trying to impact and having them involved in that recommendation process, whatever, is really important. Um, yeah, uh, that's a very complex question, and I bet there are 50 people working on 50 different approaches, and all of them are needed. Oh, not being a clinician, that's not quite in my uh, wheelhouse. However, um, as a person of goodwill, um, I look for opportunities where I can either speak at public events or you know, educate um, friends and family. Um, there are a few opportunities for me in that realm for which I'm in the Department of Pediatrics. And so, you know, we are uh, engaged with the babies of the mamas. And in order to have a healthy baby, we need a healthy mama. Uh, and so, uh, I, in the distant past, I would do things like um, go lobby in Austin for um, injury prevention. but. Uh, other than that, I, I don't really know that I uh, am uh, that targeted toward the question. Can I add one more thing? I um, One of the things that I uh, do is I travel around to different hospitals and work with the healthcare teams. And over and over, what I hear them try to do is the same thing that isn't working, just better. <laughs> so I agree everything with what you just said with innovation. For example, like just last week, I got the question of, um, we're working on this new hypertensive bundle where um, we're trying to kind of teach teams how to manage preeclampsia better. And one of the things is seeing women back within three days of discharge because so much changes in those first few days. And the questions I get all over the place are, well, you know, tell me what I do for women who didn't have prenatal care and they want to just schedule them for an appointment. But clearly the system didn't work for them. So you can't just do the system more to get them to respond differently. So I, I totally agree. I think that's where innovation and including the people who it didn't work for is so critical. Um, and something somehow people totally forget to do each time. Did we have any other questions in the audience? Because I'm just wondering about the opportunities and similarities. When you were thinking about designing your change bundle, that process of design, I think, has a lot of similarities to the process of engineering design that April was discussing. And I think there's a huge amount of opportunity for learning and innovation and sharing if um, if you can bring engineers into that process. And so I'm just curious to learn more about how you approach the design of the change package. And if you think people like Dr. Lovelady and her team of engineers could be a part of that. Um, yes, definitely. I think, um, do we do that enough? Probably not. I had a wonderful discussion yesterday with an electrical engineer student who was looking for what she can do in the maternal mortality space. So it's so exciting. I feel like 10 years ago, I wouldn't, you know, I, nobody was saying that sort of thing. Um, and we know it's just not a space where there's been a lot of change. Like, look at things like breast pumps. They were so ridiculously antiquated without any improvement for so long. 
Um, so yes, I agree. I think we're trying to do better with that. And so it takes a little bit longer to create things when you do them well. Um, and then we get a lot of, you know, wanting to make it perfect before it's released. Sadly, when you make something perfect, more people die in the meanwhile. So it's a very, it's a, it's a hard balance, um, that I think we're moving towards, but have a long way to go. And I agree with what you said. I want to, I want to make one little correction. Um, so again, the beautiful thing about where I work is we're not just a team of engineers, we're a team of uh, medical doctors and engineers. So you can imagine trying to get two, um, <laughs> two groups of people who are typically, typically introverted, you know, to talk to each other, to design collaborative solutions, right? And so one of the things that, that I do is, um, again, I'm trying to learn to speak the language of the physician. And I'm trying to teach the physician the language of the engineer so that we don't we don't miscommunicate whenever we are coming up with um, with solutions. And I think that oftentimes happens as well. If we can't blend amongst ourselves, amongst ourselves being like among the innovate, innovators that are in the group, then how can we ever expect to develop blended solutions? And so again, that all goes back to, I think, effective communication of um, the people that are on the team. It, I just had the question, if there is a death of a mother that is there's a suspected um, maybe racial discrimination that had to do with his her death, um, maybe what are the steps of the of the M&Ms or the discussion around the death that could maybe affect change later um, um, about that? Thank you. What a thoughtful question. Um, at the state... Maternal Morbidity and Mortality Review Committee, our state legislature requires complete redaction of the cases. So they are reviewed completely anonymous to location, provider, patient, all of those things. There are a number of things going forward in this session to reduce that. Um, like, for example, it's heartbreaking to look at ongoing hemorrhage deaths when we think we've given them all the tools to do it, and they just probably don't know what they're not doing. So that's where we need to go into those hospitals and really help them, but can't because we can't tell. Texas is the only state that also has legislatively mandated levels of care, which means all maternal and neonatal hospitals for the last couple of years have to be surveyed, and there are set standards that they have to meet, including case review of all cases of severe maternal morbidity or death. And then people go in to look at those case reviews to make sure that they identified the problems and did meaningful things from them. Um, so I think that process has huge potential. Um, and then we are also trying to, at the state level, get funded a statewide database so that all patient level data, like right now what you see is from administrative data, there's about an 18 month lag. We can't identify it at any other level. So really trying to help teams with real time quality improvement with an actual independent data system that um, lives a little bit separately from current administrative data. Um, so something I've noticed in terms of um, medical schools and just like education in general and in doing DEI work is it's very workshop and let's focus on this for a day or focus on it the first month of education. My, my fiance is in medical school, so I've seen her talk about it. And it's just let's talk about it for a month and then let's go. go let's keep going with our medical education. And there's barely any discussion. Um, and. So how do you, in Baylor or maybe in the engineering medicine program, how do you focus on those, on inclusivity on a daily, like when you educate people about any random medical case, but incorporate the inclusion in there, not just as an afterthought? Yes, thank you for that question. Uh, you're absolutely right. Um, let's be clear about that. When we do this workshop, we're looking at um, knowledge, primarily, and maybe some attitudes. But the real, real test would to be to you know, follow the students around and to uh, measure behaviors. So how do they treat patients? How do they treat one another? How do they treat their colleagues? Um, that's extremely hard to do. Um, however, there's a couple of things that make me a little bit hopeful. Uh, first of all, that uh, the DEI movement has really, really accelerated. We have DEI officers, we have a dean for DEI, 
uh, and our medical school uh, enrollment is increasing. Uh, back when we first started this, we were looking at about 12% underserved minorities. We're now enrolling up to 28 to 30% uh, uh, underrepresented in medicine minorities. So change is coming. It you know moves at the pace of a glacier, um, but uh, you know it is at least moving in the right direction. And yes, that was a reference to Martin Luther King Jr. I think that was really well said. Um, and fortunately for me, because I am the director of their innovation immersion experiences, like all students sort of come through me with their projects. And what I'm seeing is an increasing number of our students who are focused on uh, clinical issues that impact minorities. Um, we have one student, for example, was looking, who wanted to look at a different way of detecting melanoma um, using nail beds, but it, it doesn't really work so well for minorities, right? So we have students who are looking into those things. For me personally, um, I think I just try to keep it at the forefront of all my students that I talk to because it's 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 in my head, right? So whenever I'm talking to my students, then I also talk to them because in some cases it's it's been a lived experience of mine. And so I just continue to talk to them. I will say that it makes me a little nervous though, right? Because I don't want to be labeled as this is gonna sound bad. I don't, you know, so forgive me. I don't think of a politically correct way to say it. So I'm just gonna be transparent and honest. But um it's sometimes difficult for me to continue to be the person to advocate for minorities when I'm the minority on the team, because I feel like it's going to become, oh, here she comes again. There she is again, talking about women, you know, or talking about minorities. And um, so, but even in that, I do try to push through my own fear. Maybe that's just a fear of mine, but I do try to push through my own fear and sort of keep those topics at the forefront of the conversation, at the forefront of the lectures, at the forefront of um, my interactions with my students. And so not to cram anything down their throats, but to just say, hey, you know, um, be inclusive as you think of your solutions. So I have a question here. Um, and so how, I guess for the panel, but just like how much do you fall back on on history of different medical events that have occurred that you still see some of the, I mean, back then we saw many of those factors with HIV patients, with syphilis in the whole Tuskegee event. And then, and then even today we even see where Latino patients don't get everything translated into Spanish. So there's a lot of misinterpretation. I mean, do you fall back on those constantly? And do those, are those presented in the classroom setting as well? And how much is that dwelled on? So again, my main audience is hospitals. Um, started talking about the importance of health equity. You know, it was a very, um, disheartening session with all the feedback I got afterwards, which is why are you turning maternal safety into a political issue? But it was so important because I think it showed how far we had to come. Um, and also um, because of that, the things that, that they needed to understand to not think it was a political issue. So incorporating like when we're trying to teach folks about why we want them assessing for social determinants of health as part of healthcare outcomes, looking at redlining, looking at historical background. Um, and I think, and so yes, I would say those are things that are, at, that at least when I'm working with teams, we add in, and then I feel like you have to do it over and over and over and over and over and over for it to sink into different people at different times. Even my own husband and family the other day said, you know, you do so much better talking about this now than you used to. And I realized they, you know, heard it during the pandemic when everything was virtual and they heard me kind of learning how to say things to folks. And then I would hear my kids starting to repeat stuff to their family members or their family members, their friends. So I think it takes saying it but different things resonate with different people as well, so it's it's layers. But I agree 100% with what you said. It's building it into the infrastructure in everything you do that is so important, not, all right, this is the day we're going to address health equity and the impact of bias in medicine. It's like every every case you look at, every patient interview, every everything, making sure it's it's an integral part of it. But history is so important, and I think you have to bring up different things at different points in time, like I had, you know, a person I work with just now tried to say, all right, we should stop caring for this group of patients because we have to triage, you know, what we can do because of hospital capacity. And so really going back to why this is exactly the population we do not want to restrict access for historically. And then she went, oh, I didn't even think of that kind of thing. So it's invaluable in my experience. 
I'll just echo that uh, by saying yes. Um, we do a deep dive into uh, health equity within the first year medical school in our ethics course, and we continue to build on that every year. Every single course has what we call a course overview document, and in it they have to address specific issues related to how DEI is included within that course. And uh, again, we uh, are also in the process of redoing our curriculum such that um, you know, in every facet of it, that it is something that um, is at least considered. I want to say that there's there's history and then there's history, right? And so the Tuskegee experiments, that's something that we hear about all the time, um, you know, infamously. But I think within my own community, we talk about um, um, history like of our mothers, right? So not with the Tuskegee Airmen. So my own mother passed away in 2018 of a heart attack. And I'm convinced that if I could have gotten her to a doctor, that maybe we could have, you know, saved her, right? But she'd had such um, negative experiences with doctors until I could not get her to go. Um, even within my, my own life, I had to have um, a surgery and I went to a doctor and he says, oh, we're just going to cut your, your abdominal, we're just going to cut you vertically. I'm like, who, like, who does that, right? And so I was like, I'm going to go find a minority physician who cares about me, right? And so I did. I went and found a minority physician and I knew I had some scar tissue. She says, oh, that's okay. I deal with scar tissue all the time. And then here I am today without like some huge vertical incision, right? Um, and so I saw all that to say there's history and then there's history. And so we in the minority community, we talk about the things that happen with our moms and with our aunts and with, with our grandparents, as opposed to talking about things that happened um, further along. And so history is still in the making, right? I guess is my real point that even though we've talked about, you know, some of these, uh, you know, more infamous historical events, broadly within our own sort of little communities, we talk about the things that happen, have happened more recently, but also broadly like uh, throughout that particular generation. So for me, I continue, yes, I do talk about some of the historical aspects, but I continue to share my own stories as well um, of things that happen with my family and things that happen with me, just so students know these are not days gone by, right? That this is today and we still need innovators to address these issues today, 